everyone. Um, my name is Markus Glaser. I am from Blue Spice, and um, I want to take you on a journey today, uh, which is about security on a professional level, let's put it that way, um, being a small company, right? So that's the journey we did, we had to make. Um, and um, there are some experiences, some thoughts I want to, um, yeah, have you participate with me. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about compliance frameworks, about tools and stages, and about vulnerability management. That's why you should fasten seatbelts, because it's going to be super fast, and there's a lot of content <laughs> in there. Okay, um, let's talk about why is security an issue? I mean, apart from the obvious fact that you should provide secure software and it does a lot of harm if you don't do secure software. Um, but as a uh, person dealing with a company or organization dealing with other organizations, there is a lot of regulations and a lot of related norms which you have to probably not know uh, all of them, but if you talk to customers of a certain organizational size, you will probably come across some of these, like ISO 2701, which is information security. Um, in Germany, you do BSIT Grundschutz, which is something related. You do ITIL. Um, there's NIS, too, in Europe is a big deal now, network and information security. Um, and there is like C5 cloud, compliance cloud, whatever context conclusion requirements. So that's C5, it's, it's also standard if you are a cloud developer. And that's, of course, that's not an exhaustive list, right? So um, all of them um, touch the topic of security somehow if you do um, software development and if you are in touch with one organization that implements one or two or um, uh, several of these norms, you will be confronted with questions like, how do you ensure security? How do you test your software? Have you documented stuff and um, things like that? So that's what happened in, um, in my company. Um, we get, uh, increasingly we get requests. We need to fill in questionnaires. Uh, how do we do stuff and make sure and can you prove um, you comply with all of these regulations or some of these. Um, good thing is a lot of them overlap. So I take um, some examples, so C5, that's the cloud um, compliance uh, um, <clears throat> framework. Um, it mentions a few focus areas where you should take a look on, that's software development, software deployment and operation. I guess that's also rather obvious, but um, different stages require different tools. So that's gonna play a role later. Um, NIS. <laughs> for example, says um, you need to do several things in your threat modeling. You need to identify attack surfaces, so um, you need to know where your software can be attacked. That's important. If you don't know that, you can't mitigate um, it. And you need to identify dependencies and external components. So that's also very important, and I think that's also a big, uh, big blind spot in like standard software development, at least it was in my company. Um, so these, uh, apart from, uh, from requiring you to do automated testing, or I think automated testing, comes in handy here to um, identify these things and um, to get like almost complete lists of stuff. So um, that is something we're gonna take a look in, um, and I'm gonna show you a little bit of a tool set here. Um, but, uh, of course, it's important to mention that these frameworks do not entirely rely on automated processes. Um, they, most of the time, they do not even mention it. So they say you need to have a complete list of all your dependencies, and then you say, okay, how on earth am I going to do this? Yeah, I can write, like, one thing is do a process. I can require my developers um, to, um, to uh, add an entry to a certain file every time they add an external dependency. And actually, we've tried this. It worked for exactly one day, and that was the day where I collected all the existing dependencies. And that. No, it was two days, because Robert helped me. Um, so, and, and after that, we completely forgot about it, and we did not have a updated complete list. So that's where automation comes in handy, um, and where you need it. And I guess similar thing is um, attack surfaces, um, of course, your software evolves every day, so whenever you have a new variable, you, you add a new input field, whatever, um, uh, you need to 
think security, of course, but you can also forget security at some points. So it's, it's important to have some automated tools that help you identify these vectors, identify these, these places. Um, but that's what, what I, what's important is the norms themselves, they do not require you to automate stuff. So they say you need to take care that this happens, not how it happens. Um, and there's a lot of uh, also um, uh, one, two things I want to point out. So all these norms require you to think security in all stages of development. So that's planning and implementation and, um, of course, testing, deployment. So that's one thing. The other is um, a lot of stuff can also be covered by using policies, training, um, and things like that. So um, in order to, I'm not saying that if you use the three tools I'm going to show you today, then you are compliant with these <coughs> norms, but it's a big building brick. Okay. Um, so how, um, how did we do this? So we started uh, using automated testing. Good news is if you use the MediaWiki ecosystem, you get a lot of stuff for free. It's already built in. Um, that's because, of course, uh, Wikipedia somehow also, um, I don't think they need to comply, but um, they are like one um, lighthouse project um, and they are very, um, a very big attack uh, target. So they need to be secure and they need to implement all the best practices um, these norms require you. So um, two things that you get for free, um, code review, um, very important, so that's not automated, but semi-automated. Um, but of course, code review um, is a good way of ensuring security if you have a bit of awareness and if you did a little bit of training for your developers first. So then code review is very good. And of course, you get uh, static code analysis. That's also um, very big in, in the MediaWiki environment. So um, we've uh, talked about uh, code sniffer and um, fixing uh, tainted code. Um, uh, we have, um, we find things like the minus X check. I don't know if you ever saw that. That uh, makes sure, <laughs> ensures that you don't, that you have correct file permissions when you upload something to Garrett. Um, and of course you have code sniffer and you have fan, uh, which is also a um, code analysis tool. So um, that's the static code analysis and that happens per commit. So when you do a commit, then uh, these tests run and ideally uh, you, do not, um, <clears throat> you do not make these tests fail so you comply and there is a good level of basic security. Then, um, but what happens if you want to have like a more integrated system like a media wiki plus some extensions, right? So it's not on a per commit basis but you wanna see uh, what happens in my whole system. And that is where, um, where my tooling, uh, the tooling I'm gonna show you comes in. So one of the things we have found is um, a software bill of materials. That's what I is, is the heading. Um, so libraries, okay. We use Compose a lot. We use libraries a lot um, that we use from different sources. And these libraries, um, they, um, let's say it's a symphony library for just for example. Um, you take and then uh, um, at a certain point, so you include that in your, um, in your code in a specific version and then um, a vulnerability occurs, some, some people discover it and how do you know? So how do you know that you need to update your version because what you do in your dependencies, you write, um, I want, uh, I don't know, this library in the specific version, one, um, 1010x, I mean, we've, we've heard about semantic versioning today. So um, if, if the library follows semantic versioning, you are maybe somewhat lucky, but still you need to rebuild. Um, so it doesn't, ha it doesn't happen automatically, so you need to somehow know. So one good thing is there are some security scanners out there like Composer Audit or PHP Security Scanner or Trivi, um, which can help you there. Um, they go through your Composer um, log files through your NPM files, and they check if your um, used libraries do have any known vulnerabilities. Um, and that's, yeah, that's how it looks like. I mean, that's not super exciting because it's all console and text, but the content is very exciting. So it shows us that we don't have any, <coughs> uh, 
vulnerabilities and in known vulnerabilities in this scan, but there are some unmaintained packages we're using. So one question we can talk about that at some point. So would you treat an unmaintained package also an insecure package? Um, we have decided not to for the time being, and I'm going to tell you why. But um, So that's what uh, it gives you an initial picture. There's also another tool called Trivi, um, which um, can also scan your composer log files. Um, Trivi does not use the unmaintained stuff and does not show it to you, but um, it has a broader scope, so you can um, scan other uh, things other than PHP or Node.js using Trivi as well. Okay. Um, Okay, so here a uh, question, um, th there are some questions. So um, we decided to ignore all DEF requirements. So we only check um, a composer production requirements. So you have two, basically two sections in your composer file, require and require DEF. Um, we ignore the DEF requirements. So if there's a vulnerability in there, we just say it's okay because it's not used in production, right? Um, uh, we don't know currently how to test JavaScript libraries, so um, it's really hard. Uh, we had a discussion when we went here. Um, so you could theoretically wrap JavaScript in NPM um, modules and use NPM as a checker if your JavaScript library has an NPM um, package for it. But um, that's one of the more tricky parts which we are working on. Um, so currently we would say, okay, if um, say, uh, there's a, a CVE in, 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 in jQuery, um, then we would rely on the MediaWiki package to identify that and then know that we have a, a vulnerable jQuery version which we are actually serving. <coughs> and uh, yeah, question, how do we <coughs> deal with abandoned libraries? Um, okay, so that's the list of third-party libraries we're using. Um, we also uh, wanted to know, and now we're getting more towards um, infrastructure here, deployment. So you remember I said we need to cover development, deployment, and operations. Um, so deployment is the infrastructure. So we have one media wiki. We put it into a Docker container. The Docker container itself can also be insecure, right? So it could be there's an issue with the Docker container. <clears throat> So that, um, we covered that using Trivi, again, Trivi on um, a package manager, package registry, that's called Harbor. Um, it looks like this. So we have, um, we build a Docker container, and when we build it, we push it to a container registry. And in the container registry, the, the builds are scanned using trivia, trivia and then it gives you like the vulner vulnerability score. Interesting bit here is it's virtually impossible to get that down to zero. So it's basically, this is the official MongoDB image, so it's not a hollow image, and even they have medium vulnerabilities which they are <coughs> shipping, um, and that's one of the good ones. So you get, uh, you get Dockers which have criticals um, which are open for like years. Um, so that's a very interesting thing if you plan your infrastructure and the ecosystem using Docker containers. Um, okay, so um, that's how uh, it, what it looks like, and then you can get this cool list. And you can see here is is a lot, right? So that's also something that um, we have to somehow deal with. So um, we said. Um, initially, we want to focus on critical and high issues. So you see, you get a ranking of issues, medium, low. We want to get rid of all the high and critical rated uh, issues, um, and we deal with the medium at a later stage, right? Um, so one other question is, how can we, again, um, so once you build a Docker, it's like a compiled Docker image, so it's fixed, right? Um, so if then uh, a vulnerability occurs, um, you need to update the packed software, the software that's packaged into your image. Um, and what's a good way to do it? So you can maybe, and that's one thing we're thinking about, is just simply to rebuild the Docker containers on a regular basis and do the like update, up get, upgrade, um, or update, and get the newer versions, the non, not so vulnerable versions of images. Um, one 
idea. Okay, um, so these two um, are more static. So um, there's a the bit of materials goes for the composer uh, log file. Um, this uh, uh, trivi goes for a compiled but not running Docker container. Um, <coughs> wrong direction. But we also have um, uh, tests where we need to um, work against like a running instance of something. So one is dynamic application security testing. I'm always give, trying to give you the, um, the words that are used in norms. Um, so that's D-A-S-T when you come across that dynamic application security test. Uh, what, uh, what does it do? Um, so I'm, uh, we, we went for a SAP, OWASP, OWASP SAP. So that's a um, open source vulnerability. Uh, OWASP, you probably know that. I don't know the acronym, but it's um, a list of like top security threats you, um, you see on the internet. And they have like updated lists of most current security threats. Uh, which they give you every year, every half year. Um, and they have an associated project that's the um, Send Attack Proxy, ZAP, SAP, um, which uh, uses this knowledge of what's the most common um, attack surfaces, um, and it tries to attack your software with this. Um, obviously, that's where you need a, a software installed. You cannot attack a software that's not running. So that's what we see here. Um, so basically, you can <coughs> you can install the software. It's a do Most of the software I'm going to show, I'm show I'm showing you is just Docker container. So you can just start up the Docker container. Um, it's a one a two liner. Then you get a graphical interface, and then you can run it. So here you click on attack, which is very nice if you have your own software, and then you go attack now. <laughs> I, I love that. Um, and it starts spidering your software. So you, you give it, of course. I didn't show that. You, you need, of course, to give it an entry point. <coughs> Otherwise, it will attack the whole internet and you will be cut off fast. Um, OK, so um, it starts spidering uh, your software. So it starts loading pages, like in, in this case, the main page, and then all associated resources. And it tries clicking on the links. And, um, so it gives you a list of what can I reach. Um, and then. Uh, when it knows where it can reach, then it tries to attack. So here, for example, we have um, we have an API call, and it tries different values in the action, and then sees can I you know can I get something back? Can I break it? And can I get a response that um, we don't expect? Um, and then um, after it ran, so so this scan the, the spidering runs for uh, for for blue spice, which is probably similar to MediaWiki here. It runs for 15 minutes, so 15 minutes to get all the links. If you do an attack on all the, um, the URLs, then it will take one and a half days. So you need to basically then narrow it down. Um, that's what I did here, um, where I said, OK, please attack only um, one uh, URL, and like the api.php API thing, um, and see where you can get from there. <coughs> OK, and then you get these super cool reports. And um, then you get uh, super cool lists. Um, if you look here, with like 1,516 instances of CSP uh, violations, content security policy. Um, and then you are like, oh my god, how am I going to deal with this? Um, it's virtually not possible, or unless you have automated tools. But the good thing here is, since it's spidering, it gets a lot of redundant uh, pages. And that's um, what you have to um, rule out then. But of course, that's a challenge. So you can mark stuff as false positive and deal with that. OK. So questions we had here, and, and I'm, I have to admit, the SAP is still in very early stage at Halloween. So we just started using this. Um, is breadth versus, step, well, versus depth. So do we, more, do we do more spidering or do we do more like selected attacks? Probably we do both, but you can't do a combination. Like you can't spider and attack because that's just too long, too much. Um, so you need to pick some URLs and then try attack them. Um, uh, of course, here again, um, 
one thing we did a lot is scope it to unauthenticated use. So that's my, my most significant use case. If I want to have secure software, I want to be secure against um, the outside world in the first place, right? So, I mean, of course, in the second step, we can also do this against authenticated, like privilege ev elevation and stuff like that. But first thing is make sure that nobody who's not, who shouldn't be in the system gets into the system, right? So um, sco we scope uh, everything to unauthenticate. Um, okay. And um, last tool I'm gonna show you is uh, deployment security, it's, it's more like operation security, to be honest. Um, so this a, a tool that uh, we, we, we try to use here is Greenbone, Greenbone Security Scanner, um, which is also a vulnerability scanner, but it scans like infrastructure instead of um, an application. So um, what it does in our case is we send it against the cloud service we're running. Um, and then um, I give you a list of like all IPs we have, all the servers we have in the cloud service, and I say now try to figure out how you could get in, how you could possibly get in. Um, this is interestingly, and, and luckily this is non, um, non-destructive, so I can, uh, it just scans, right? It doesn't try breaking. Um, so you can also run it against the production environment. Um, and I think that's where it's actual uses, mostly here, at least for us. Um, it's very, it's quickly to set up. You start it, you give it a list of IPs, and then you get this um, severity reports of, of vulnerabilities. Um, of course, as usual, you have to assess them. I'm not gonna show you the mediums because that's, um, they're not lo no longer there, of course. Um, <laughs> and the one that's still there has a reason. Um, but so you get these lists and then you can go through this and mitigate them one by one. If you need. Again, um, we said we focus on unauthenticated. Um, and uh, again, we focus on high and critical issues. So we don't focus on, um, we don't focus on low. Right, okay. So, um, the lessons learned, that's just more or less a, uh, a recap. So um, you need to be able to keep an overview, especially initially when you start those tests or those tools. They give you a lot of, uh, of, um, uh, of reports. Um, you need to uh, make sure that you narrow it down to something you can cope with. Um, related to that is you need to establish a baseline. So it's better to start off with something you know didn't we have that in, in, in the LTS talk today? Um, it's, it's better to have something where you know it, may, it, it, it has some known vulnerabilities, but it doesn't change from there on, right? So you go to the future. Um, so you establish a baseline, you try to mitigate the most critical stuff, of course, so you don't leave like, the big doors open. Um, but uh, then you need to uh, check not to get regressions or not to make the situation worse. Um, so that's when you continuously test, keep the test green, treat any regression as a prior one. That's important, stay in the green. Um, some issues are not resolvable. Um, that is something you have to come up with a strategy to deal with. Um, as I said, the MongoDB image, I'm not gonna resolve that. That's the official MongoDB image. If they give me a broken, um, a, 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 an image that has vulnerabilities, What's my option? I mean, only option is I, do, I can't use the Docker container of MongoDB, right? So then you have to come up with a strategy how to do it. And what's really important, stay up to date with the definitions here. That's what I would try to give you. Um, since I only have minus one minute, um, I'm gonna skip the CVE part here. Um, so that's cool, I have a follow-up talk at the next SMWCon. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Yeah, so um, you see here in the periodically, um, I think what you should do, and I don't, I'm not saying we do it, um, is to 
periodically revise those ignore lists, right? Because sometimes you put something on an ignore list um, because you know it's going to be fixed. Um, for example, there's, uh, yeah, I don't know, um, I'm not, not picking examples, but it happens that you say, okay, I need to ignore this for the time being, but the next release we have upgraded because, I don't know, we, we switched the library. We can't switch it now because the code uh, updates require an, a, a minor release on our end or a patch release on our end, so we need to just deal with it until that point, right? Um, and uh, the only option I have is check those uh, ignore lists on a regular basis. I mean, the other option would be to just not use the ignore list, but then you have these thousands of uh, false positives. False positives. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.